Management. So Corina uh, is, a, is a woman that learns uh, very fast and he works in every, um, in every um, role uh, of a Scrum. He was product owner, he was developer, he was Scrum master, but she confessed always that he preferred to, to be a developer. So I'm not going to delay more uh, his inter interaction in the, in the room. So uh, I leave you in their hands. So thank you very much. I'm uh, sorry in advance, I have a really bad cold. So uh, sorry for the voice, it's usually a bit, a bit more pleasant. But um, I really feel like I watched Firefly in Spanish just so that today here with you I can stand and quote, no hay poder en el verso que me detenga. Not uh, something to see there. <coughs> okay. Um, when Alberto approached me about the keynote, uh, he didn't uh, suggest a topic. It was open for discussion. So I um, asked him, uh, do you have like a motto or a slogan, uh, something that can spark associations? And he told me, well, we do have that hashtag, want to change. And uh, if you think about it as much as I did, it's a great motto, because you can have all kinds of associations, and I had lots of ideas, but in the end, there was really just one topic that I could talk about. It's maybe a bit back to basics, but uh, given the great, great love that I have for retrospectives, when you tell me one thing that can introduce change, well, it's going to be retrospectives, so let me elaborate. <coughs> I think that retrospectives have great Let's call it generating power, so that if you set aside time to reflect on how you're doing things as a group and come up with ideas for how to do it better, then eventually you will end up in a pretty great place. And it doesn't matter so much where you started or how big. Sometimes your steps will be really small, sometimes they will be big, but the end result will be pretty cool. Um, and there's one person who already said it perfectly, so I'm going to quote him. Uh, Woody Tsul, I have no idea how that name is pronounced. You might know him from, he's very verbal about mob programming. And he said, if you adopt only one agile practice, there are so many to choose from, then let it be retrospectives, and everything else will follow from that. So these generating powers. And I still remember the first time I heard about retrospectives. Um, I was in April 2010, and I was part of the very first cross-functional Scrum team at my company, and we were all trained in how you do Scrum. So there's a product owner, and there's a backlog, and there's a planning meeting, and daily stand-ups. You learn all these things, and when they came to retrospectives, I had this massive light bulb moment um, that this time to reflect and find better ways as a group, as a team, not just a group, common goal and all, that I'm going to take this everywhere I go with me. And it doesn't matter if I stay in IT and it doesn't matter if I do Scrum, I will take this with me because this is a great idea. And uh, this love stayed with me, although our beginnings, the way we actually did retrospectives, were pretty humble. Um, we got also trained how to do retrospectives, and they showed us exactly one way to do it. I'm going to share it with you. Um, we would write down, everybody would write down the topics they wanted to talk about on a sticky note. We would give it a plus or a minus, depending on what, whether it was something positive or negative. We'd cluster them. In huge, huge clusters. So for 20 or 25 stickies, you would only have like four or five clusters. So clustering stickies that really talk about the same thing, that's a good idea. Clustering stickies that vaguely all are about how the team works together, or vaguely all about how the team works together with somebody else, not such a great idea. <coughs> uh, we dot word with them, which you can see here. 
Uh, usually, all the classes would get about the same, uh, same amount of votes, because the important and the unimportant stickies were lumped up in them. <coughs> um, and then we would talk about each one of the top voted clusters, the important and the unimportant ones. And don't get me wrong, so we did that for half a year. In the end, it became pretty boring, and we also tended to have always the same topics and the same solutions. Um, if you're doing nothing, this is better than nothing. Especially at the beginning, we did get value out of it. We did have ideas for improvement, and it at least brought us, synced us up as a team, or then without a retrospective. Um, still not really recommended. If you want something really low-key, my advice for you is Google Lean Coffee. You will get better results than that very coarse idea. And to be fair, I don't think the trainers expected us to just stick with the first thing they showed us for half a year. But <coughs> our Scrum Master at the time did. We all had double roles, so all Scrum Masters were also developers. It was a really hard task. I cannot recommend the double role. It doesn't work good. Can you understand me at all? Okay, great, thank you. <laughs> um, and then, after half a year, I became um, a Scrum Master. So, Master, more like Scrum Bachelor, or uh, maybe not even that, because we didn't really know that much in the beginning. Uh, and that was about the time when I, read, uh, when I read a ton of books. Really, like, I've never read that much nonfiction in my life, because I wanted to do a good job. So I read and read and read. And in hindsight, the book that certainly influenced my life the most was this one, Agile Retrospectives, by uh, Diana Larson and Dustin Derby. Uh, if you're starting with retrospectives, this is still, so I think, what, 10 years after writing, this is still the book about retrospectives. So when you start, start with that one. It's really good. Um, <coughs> and I learned, hey, wait a minute, actually, you can or you should have phases in your retrospectives. You should set the stage, get everybody from there, flip the switch from their normal work life to, hey, we're now in retrospective mode. And then you gather data so that everybody remembers what you actually did and how you did it. And um, that you have a shared pool of information, not just the way I view the world, but the way Marcus sees the world and the way Carson sees the world. So those are teammates of mine. Mm. And then you really want to generate some insight, which is to say, not take the first solution that comes to your mind, but maybe look at all the data that you've gathered differently, come up with something novel something original, which might be better. <coughs> then you pick something that you actually want to do, and then it's time to close the retrospective. Usually that's the time when you try to improve on the retrospective itself, but not always. So, I learned all these, these phases and the activities that are in the book, which are the things that you can do in the, in the phases, and I quickly learned when I started to facilitate my own retrospectives that when you ask a new question from a different angle, that then you also get new answers and you actually you find new classes of problems that people didn't see as a problem before. Uh, so it was always there, but you somehow thought it was like inherent in the system. So, uh, and sometimes all that's needed is like a change of perspective something easy like asking, okay, um, we see the sprint like this, the last one. If you were our boss, what would you think about it then, the way we behaved? Or if you were customer support, how, what would you then think about the way we handled that outage? Um, or another thing that you can easily do is metaphors. Um, they are really powerful. For example, if the last sprint had been a car, what kind of car had it been? And it's a real difference whether it's a sturdy Toyota or a flashy but not very reliable Alfa Romeo, that's, or a Sierra Leone, that's a big 
difference. And sometimes um, this trick of the metaphor allows people to phrase things that they didn't even know they were thinking. It's that rich. Um, and all these new questions, so I began to, to look for them, to find new ways, because, well, the book only has so many activities and you want to do even more, or at least I wanted to. <coughs> this, again, involved a lot of reading, this time blogs, because there are a lot of very capable, very nice people who share their ideas for retrospectives with the world, but they are all over the place. So what would usually happen is that about once per month I would go like, oh, this is a great activity, I want to do it, I'm easily excitable, maybe you've picked up on that. Um, I want to do that. And I'd make a bookmark and a mental note and I'd never get back to it. I wouldn't find it again or it would just sit there in that folder with the other 50 bookmarks of things that I thought I'd like to try. <coughs> so. What I kept thinking was that I'd like a central place to get me started. And the first idea <laughs> that I had was that I would build a slot machine, so a digital slot machine, complete with a lever that you could pull, and then you would have like five slots, and then ding, 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 with an animation. You could have one activity for each phase. I'm not that good of a designer, though. Um, so what it actually looks like is this, but I did build it. And I started it with uh, 16 activities, so roughly three in every one of the five phases. And uh, when I launched it, it wasn't a huge success because it wasn't that valuable yet. There were only 16 ideas in there. But I've added over the years, and in recent years I get so many suggestions that I can't keep up with adding them, actually. So nice. The Agile community is great. Thank you, thank you, everybody who ever submitted a, an activity. Um, and Retromart became really uh, successful when it had about 50 activities, and now it has 115, I think. And, and I'm very proud to say that here it has been translated to four languages, one of them Spanish, actually. Spanish is the one with the most translated activities, nearly 100. And uh, so I don't know about these people, but I know Pedro is here. Can you stand up? Okay. Because, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for doing this, because I thought I'll never have 400 people again clapping for him, so yay. <laughs> um, and this is where I jump out of history mode and get into interactive mode. Ah, the first row is like interactive. I'm sitting in the first row, was that a mistake? Dios mio, I hope she's not gonna put me on the spot. Don't worry. Um, it's not gonna be interactive with me, it's gonna be interactive between you. Um, this is also where I'd like the light. <laughs> Thank you. So, there should be light soon. Um, because I was thinking, this is the closing keynote for a very nice, very dense, very, I hope, great experience for you. Um, and I like to take the time so that each of you can reflect a little. Because if you're anything like me, you will have like tons of notes, about 20 pages of notes, and uh, lots of, oh, I should try this moments. But when you get home, there's everyday life, and there's work to do, and there's tickets to work on and stuff that you didn't get around to do while you were here. So I'd like to take the time now so that you can reflect a little. And I'd like to start with sit back, relax, maybe close your eyes if you like to. What was your best CAS moment, your best experience here these two days? What has been awesome? Can be um, a big insight that you had can be that you met someone new. Can be that it was just plain funny. Think about it. You have it? Because now 
It's sharing time. I mean, we're not a usual team, so you might not know the people next to you. But like right now, I'd like for you to find a neighbor or somebody behind you and tell them what was your best cast moment, and they will tell you yours. Team up. <laughs> we've, got, <laughs> we've got three minutes. <coughs> you too. And, yeah. Have a mic? Ah, switch. If you haven't switched, it's now for your partner to speak, please. So this means switch. companies in Barcelona, mm. I'm in Madrid, but uh, we work together and sometimes I went to Barcelona mm. and then sometimes he went to, to Madrid and, and he's very kind. And yeah. <laughs> Ten seconds. <laughs> Ten seconds. Thank you. So I hope that was fun. <laughs> and now we'll come to the <coughs> slightly more uh, work-specific <laughs> moment. What have you learned here that you want to try at work? Like really try, like I'm totally going to do this. Um, I hope that you brought one of the notebooks that you've got. Uh, so I knew I was going to do it, so I brought mine. <laughs> um, because this is uh, for you, so for each and every one of you. Let's say like two minutes to take notes. What have I learned that I want to try at work when I get there on Monday?
Maria? Can you put the mic? Ah, okay. And we're back. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna continue with that one. If you're anything like me, you will not have one thing there. You will have like, well, throughout, uh, throughout the notebook, you will have like 20, or now maybe you've got three or so. If you've only got one, that's great for you. Uh, you get a, you get a um, fly spinning So you get a star for uh, overachieving, <laughs> um, because you're already done with this task. Because if you've got several, I'd like for you to pick one. Which one is your top priority? That can be either because you think that's the most important problem to work on, or because it's the thing that you're most excited about, or that you need a win, and it's like a low-hanging fruit that will give you a success that you can gain momentum. Can be any of these things, but pick one that you're gonna do. There's a German saying, which is roughly the small bird that you have in your hand is better than the fat one that you have on your roof. So it's better to pick one and actually do it than think that you're gonna do 10, but actually not doing any of them. Uh, I once said this guy who, so I think he was bragging. He was like, ah, oh, in my retrospectives, we always have like 10 or 15 action items. And I was like, you sound like you think that it, that is a good thing. I don't think it's a good thing because of these 10 or 50 things, you won't do any of them. Not if they are all equally important, not if you have any priority. I mean, I think the team is probably supposed to also do other work than what comes out of the retrospective. When are they gonna do 10 or 15 things? They won't, they won't have the time. So focus is the key here, I think. So pick one, if you've already got one, You've, you're on a break, you have idle time. <laughs> you, only all, you look like you're already all done. Shall I continue? <laughs> so, okay, wow, so you're really good. Give yourself a pat on the back. Um, I've been to Gabriel's session yesterday, and he's not very fond of the smart goal technique. Um, you probably know it, and <coughs> uh, if I interpret him correctly, it was mostly about the big company goals, where I agree it's better to have like a sense of direction that you want to go. Maybe I should phrase it differently. What I'm aiming here at is that you have something that you can, that you know your first step. On Monday, when I go into the office, this is what I will do, or in the first week, Next week, this is what I'm going to do. What I see often is that people have a very vague goal. So sometimes they're also completely unrealistic. That's a different story. But sometimes they are just bold, but pretty big. Something like uh, we want to hire more developers. So we get need more developers to apply. Or uh, we want to test our uh, test, uh, automate all our tests. Those are big, ambitious goals. And then sometimes, People don't know what the first step is, and so they never get started. The sticky is just there on the wall, and it loses its color, and then when you air one day, a gush of wind takes it away, and it's gone forever. So I'd like for you to be completely crystal clear. On Monday or next week, what am I going to do to start with that thing that I picked, my number one priority, what I want to do? Um, Say uh, like two minutes. Okay, um, sorry. So you are all complete overachievers. Clearly, you're very advanced. Um, the next stage was to be to do with your neighbors, but you're all already doing it with your neighbors. So I'm gonna give you four minutes. <laughs> okay. Uh, so if you haven't talked to your neighbor yet, do it because that would have been the next step, and it's now the current step. So, who here is happy with their plan of action? Ah, okay, two people at least. That's 
No, and the other is completely unhappy. Ah, okay, three people. So, and, ah, four. Okay, so it's adding up. <laughs> um, why am I such a pain in the ass about mm, having a place to start and, and then actually doing something? For me, this ties in with the question: What makes a retrospective successful? So Leo yesterday he said that uh, Scrum is not a means. Um, it's not. It's a means. It's not an end. Sorry. Um, agile. Es medida no el fin. And um, retrospectives are the same way. So this just now that mini 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 version of a retrospective was that successful. So there was uh, energy. And you all talked, so generally, good signs. But the important thing is that change happens afterwards. <coughs> so don't get me wrong, sometimes, and that's also, I mean, that's also a change, it's just not a specific action item. But sometimes what's really needed is that people hear each other and understand each other's perspective. And that's all that you need, and you don't need a specific action. And sometimes, after talking for an hour, you find out that actually that bad thing that happened during the sprint, it's one off. It's completely unlikely that it will ever happen again. You don't need to take a specific action because it was just so random. But generally speaking, what you want is a specific action to come out of it, that you try something new. You don't know yet whether it's an improvement because, hey, you only know if it's going to be better after you've tried. Try something. That's the important part here. That's, um, there are several ways to make sure that you're going to do what you said you were going to do. <coughs> so for something like we want to automate tests, that's perfect to do as a user story. So we're going to automate a specific system. We are going to automate the tests or the deployment for the Flux Compensator or a part of the Flux Compensator. Others have an impediment board or change board where they track all their change initiatives. You don't also don't want to have too many because there's only so much people can take and take keep track of at the same time. But some, definitely. Uh, sometimes all that you need is a reminder, like a calendar entry. Or uh, sometimes you, need, you want something. That, um, a colleague of mine once dubbed uh, the ass kick fairy, Ashtretfi. So it's la la ki pate arculos. So it's when you hold each other accountable, or you pick one person to hold the team accountable. That doesn't mean that they are ha that they have to be the person that actually automates those tests, but uh, they are the ones who gets into who really pushes people to do it. And there's something that I like to do, which I call phase zero. Uh, it's, I do that in front, also before all of the five phases of the usual retro. I like to um, bring the actions from last time and look at how they have fared. And um, did the team actually do them? Did I do them if there was an item for me? Um, uh, there is a fellow German woman, Judith Andresen, who wrote this book, which I think is only available in German, pretty sure. <coughs> and she uh, also has a phase zero, and she does more. She does the results uh, checking thing, but she also always uh, reintroduces the Vegas rule. So what happens in the retrospective stays in the retrospective. So I'll stress the confidentiality. Um, likewise with the prime directive, we always assume that people have good intentions and that they acted to the best of their ability and knowledge at that time. Um, and I think especially for a new team, that is a great idea to repeat and repeat and repeat, because often in uh, companies you have a blame culture and to get out of that. And uh, also that you don't gossip about the retro, that is also important to hammer down, because people will stop to talk if they know that people, like, yeah, yeah, gossip, rant about what they said. Mm. Which already brings me to the conclusion of this talk. The, um, too long didn't read, if you will. Um, start with retrospectives. Uh, I assume from the energy that was here, I assume that all of you are already doing them. But if you're not, this is the time to start, really. Um, 
learn to do them well. And that is not just for the facilitator. It's also, if you're the participant, you also have, an, from my point of view, an obligation to take part and to make it better. It's, if you've never facilitated, it really sucks if you try to get a group, of, a group of people to participate in there. So there might be other dysfunctions going on there, but uh, make it easy on them. Take part. Um, yeah, actually follow through with what you did, because if you've... I've got a confession. It's a big, big secret. From the retrospectives that I facilitate, I think 50% get done. So that's not, there is room for improvement. Um, I'm not going for 100% because sometimes the context changes or uh, it really doesn't make sense anymore to do that action. But like, I think I would be pretty happy with 80%. But yeah, I only have 50, so. I hope, is anybody doing much better than 50%? No, no hands at all, okay. Um, but if ne nothing ever gets done, then people will stop to care about the retrospective because really, what's the point of doing it? Um, yeah, and the rest will come to you in time. And, uh, well, uh, next year, when we all meet again, then we can look each other deep in the eye and ask ourselves whether this, what is now, here, on your notebook, or in your mind, but hopefully in a notebook, if you've actually followed up on that one and did what you said that you would do. And I'm gonna be your asking fairy, or, well, don't pick me, pick somebody who's nearer to you who can actually do it. <laughs> and because right now, you are the one who can introduce change into your company. Um, what Rachel said this morning, you don't want to be the bottleneck. You want to take turns. You don't want everything depend to depend on you. That is stellar advice. Take it. That's brilliant. You can't have people depend on you. Um, I think as a Scrum Master, your job is to get yourself out of the job so that people can really, they can facilitate their own stuff, for example. Maybe even coach themselves a little. Maybe if you're, if you're lucky, if you're really good. Um, but these others maybe are not here. So yes, go home and create the culture where other people also take turns, but right now it's on you. Because you were here, you saw all the sessions, you got inspired, I hope. So you are the one who can introduce change, want to change. Thank you.